small and intimate crowd. I hope everyone can hear me. Nicholas has the mic. My name is Zach Kelly. On behalf of the Center for Peacemaking, I want to welcome all of you to this year's uh, Peacemaker and President. Nicholas Lampert uh, is an interdisciplinary artist and author. His work focuses on social justice and ecology. Um, you may have seen his name if you visited the Museum of Modern Art, the uh, Art Museum downtown, the Library of Congress, or any of the 60 plus archives and collections around the world where his uh, talents are on display. Locally, though, Nicholas, and this is one of the reasons we were really inspired to have him as a peacemaker in residence, is he's known as an art organizer. He works with Hostess. De La Frontera, a Just Seeds Art Cooperative, and is a member of Art Build Workers, along with being a scholar and faculty member over at UWM at the Tech School of the Arts. Um, his first book, uh, People's History, People's Art History of the United States, was edited and has a foreword by Howard Zinn, and has really not only inspired folks here at Marquette, but around the world to think critically about the Connections between creativity, imagination, art, and critical thinking, and creating a more just society. Uh, tonight's event couldn't happen just with the Center for Peacemaking. We're indebted to our friends at the Hagerty, who co sponsored, who opened this uh, treasure that we have here on campus. And so I ask that you please join me in welcoming Nicholas as he presents a talk entitled Art and Nonviolent Social Movement. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'd, I'd like to start off by saying that I've been in Milwaukee for 20 plus years and I'm just really humbled and thrilled to uh, be invited to speak at Marquette. Uh, sometimes when we're at different universities, we're siloed in different parts of academia and the city and I Great when those, those connections happen. So I, I was absolutely thrilled to be um, part of the student led conference and to do an art build and to work with the student and the faculty in the Center for Peacemaking. It's just a great experience, uh, experience for me. So thank you, Marquette, for being a huge fan of your university. And, and, uh, and I love this museum. This has been a very important art center for a long, long time and a treasure to the whole region. So it's an honor to be here. So uh, my talk today is really about uh, the role of the artist in the social justice movement. And my path in Milwaukee, uh, I couldn't be happier to be in the city because uh, the role of the artist in the community and movements is so profound here. Um, I don't think we have a robust quote art world, and I don't have a problem with that. I think it puts our priorities uh, towards social justice and towards fixing the many problems and collaborating with so many of those outside the arts. So I find uh, this community and many other communities, small-sized cities, to be uh, the ideal place to be an artist uh, working in collaboration with the community. So I'm going to talk about a number of things that I do, uh, which is really under the umbrella of art activism, but also art builds, art affinity groups, that's the one with Moses and the other groups, and also the role of archiving social justice uh, movement culture in spaces like this. So uh, a little background about myself. I won't go way back, but my life changed forever as a young person in my 20s, uh, moving to uh, Oakland, California. I went to Oakland uh, for graduate school, and uh, I think the culture of the city and the place has a huge impact on uh, how we live and how we evolve. And the culture of the Bay Area was one of resistance, it was one of organizing, and I think I learned a lot more in, in the community and in the movements in the streets, perhaps than I did uh, even in graduate school. So uh, by you know week one that I was there, it was, it was hard not to be um, uh, deeply inspired by all the movements happening there. And I got involved uh, immediately. So you can't see me here, but this uh, in the, the background is a much younger person. Uh, there was many marches to um, to demand the freedom. Of those were some of my earliest uh, uh, you know, participations in social justice movements. And then I started to say, well, you know, I can march, I can organize, I can help with these groups, but I'm best as an artist. So I started to 
are taking photographs and starting to design images and posters. And this was an early photograph I took, not with a digital camera, but you know, with the film and everything. Uh, when Governor, then Governor Wilson was attacking the front of the action, you see Dolores Fuerte, you see Jesse Jackson, and um, the power of movements. Uh, my time in the 90s, uh, especially being in California, was really framed at the end of the decade by the organizers. Uh, the giant movement against the WTO. And I thought that was such a powerful movement because it was really combining the intersectionality of all movements and looking at corporate power and looking at uh, really the financial systems and the trade agreements and obviously the WTO. And WTO made a huge mistake having that in the West Coast because everyone up and down the West Coast from LA and Vancouver and from other parts of the world all went there to shut it down. And artists played a huge role in the organizing and direct action, including myself. Uh, we didn't call it art bills back then, but it was three to four weeks of organizing. It was artists up and down the coast recruiting people to come. And uh, November 30th was a day that uh, will forever be famous in social justice movement. And that's when tens of thousands, at least 80,000 people on the streets of Seattle and shut down essentially that whole city, but that trade. And had it not been for the momentum lost with 9-11, that was really the start of the powerful, powerful intersectional movement. Uh, but it was also the time of, um, it was the time of a militarized police. Uh, it was a time where the police looked, you know, looked uh, we're assaulting, like, it was one of the first times you saw a police dressed like this and being hit by tear gas and concussion grenades. Um, but out of this, uh, a lot of uh, the negatives, you also had the start of the TV media and so forth uh, in Seattle. But a lot of the art happened as well. Obviously, what I'm focusing in on this talk is the posters and the culture that inspires people to come to these events, uh, these massive bands. And in my training as an artist in undergraduate at Michigan, in grad school in California, you know, this wasn't what was taught. Uh, this wasn't what was taught in the art history books. So it's happened, it's been taught a lot more. And so it took me a lot of time to kind of undo that school and really think that my best role as an artist was um, in these mass mass movements. And it, as we're moving on into kind of the early 2000s, and especially out of Seattle, especially out of this kind of DIY culture, resistance culture, uh, I found a lot of like-minded artists. And my primary medium is, is graphics and printmaking. And Josh McPhee started the Just Seeds Artist Cooperative. And he invited uh, about 10 to 15 artists into it in the first round, and now we're up to 40. We have this massive network now of uh, activist artists, but really a model of a worker-run print cooperative uh, where we work directly with movements. Uh, we don't work with the gallery, not that we have anything against galleries. We want to get work that's affordable, prints to people, but primarily get prints out into the street and into movements. And while I was working on a, a really this print cooperative and being a collective member, um, I also wanted to write about the history of artists. I was starting my teaching career at UWM. I didn't feel there was a textbook um, that I could share with students that really looked at work outside the gallery and work that was, that was um, located in movements. So I wrote a, a book on the people's art history of the United States, very much modeled after Howard Zinn's um, famous book. It was inspired by him. He's the one who suggested to me that I write it. And he was the series editor. And I would never let down one of my heroes, who was Howard Zinn. So I spent a, a good decade of my life um, doing the best that I could possibly do with this book. And the book kind of mirrors my art approach, too, that it's not uh, written to a PhD crowd, it is written to a general audience. I want all this work to communicate. And so the Justine's work, I want to just give you an example of how, uh, one specific example of how the book. Works. You can find all our work, individual work on our website at justseeds.org. But 
a lot of times we reach out to movements or movements reach out to us. So the Poor People's Campaign uh, reached out to us and said, hey, can you design a print portfolio that really gets the word out on what we do? And we said, of course. And a print portfolio is when you have 30 or 40 artists working on this, each is creating a print, and then you essentially have a traveling exhibition uh, with all these copies. And here you see some of them, you see the image I made on the top. But I want to uh, focus on Jesse Purcell's image. Um, Poor People's Campaign gave us a lot of guidance in what they wanted to see, but artists, what we're best at is creativity. And that's not just creativity of image, but language. And Jesse, uh, as a actress artist up in Toronto, just came up with the slogan that wasn't given to him, but that he came up with, called "Fight Poverty, Not the Poor." Now, I would not say, with, perhaps I would say this if Jesse was here, that this is the greatest art image ever made, but it's effective in its simplicity, and it may not be as effective on the screen, but when we put our graphics up on Jesse's, they're shared. So they're downloadable free graphics that travel all over the world. They don't have a copyright on them. They have Creative Commons, and as long as uh, movements and other groups are using them for non-commercial uh, uh, purposes, they can. So this is how the Poor People's Campaign used it. And this is, to me, the importance of um, its art as media, that it gets the message across. It's designed for the camera, it's sometimes it's designed 20 to 30 feet away. Um, a good friend of mine, a mayor or art organizer, David Solman, says, if you can't read it, uh, you can't win it. And so we think a lot about that when we design. But we're not designing for the gallery, we're designing for the streets. And I was so thrilled with when the march ended in D.C. that the chosen graphic was Jesse's graphic. And that message, that slogan, to me, it was the epitome of the artist. Um, Sharing their creativity, not just their creativity, but their leadership in these movements. So, um, again, um, I am an odd a, um, art historian because I'm really an activist artist first. Uh, that's my primary goal. Um, I don't want to be at the desk or the library all the time. Uh, I want to be working in movements, designing, but also writing and talking to movies. And so, uh, this book, again, was important because uh, it was an important uh, growth experience um, for me, too, to be a better activist artist and also to teach this history. And so when we think about the role of the, of the artists and the impact that, they, that they've had, it's profound. Uh, this book is not a survey. Even though it goes through U.S. history, it has specific examples because there's so many. So my chapter on the Civil Rights Movement, I could have talked about printmakers, painters, but I talked about photographers because they truly were the eyes of the movement. You had incredible photographers who were working for uh, small papers, uh, press, you know, papers in the South, that those photographs changed history when they showed the brutality of the state uh, against nonviolent uh, demonstrators. And the U.S. could not proclaim itself as a beacon of democracy in the height of the Cold War. And these images were traveling all over the AP. But it wasn't just newspaper photographers. You had organizations like SNCC saying, we need our own photographers. We're organizing in the most dangerous remote places in rural Mississippi. The camera's not going to be there. So Julian Bond of the said, let's create a place for artists in the movement. And that's important because that doesn't happen even today. Most social justice organizations do not put forth the resources and the salary of the position for artists directly in the, in the movement. And that's the problem. Because if we don't have movement culture, we don't win these struggles. SNCC did. So Danny Lyon was the staff photographer. And Danny Lyon, obviously one of the most famous photographers of the 20th century, had two epic years. While a college student, he essentially dropped out of the University of Chicago to follow SNCC. Uh, and people were risking their lives taking photographs for uh, but this becomes an incredible poster, and SNCC recognized it. It was a recruitment poster for justice. Um, it made, and that's obviously John Lewis on the far left. The last example I'll give you from this book, uh, not as just a, uh, a hint or just to read the whole thing, but when you talk about um, the importance of art 
organizing and how it feels today, ACT UP is the model. And when I studied and researched ACT UP, that led to the thinking of how to better do art organizing within both sustainable and um, ACT UP had an affinity groups. One of the key affinity groups that they had was Grand Fury, which was the graphics collective of 12 plus people. They weren't paid. Everything they did was making graphics for that shop. Wrapped up New York, wrapped up across the country, but they were basically branding compassion and branding, branding social justice activism. You think about multi million dollar design firms, they could never have done the work that ACT UP did the silent people of death, the pink triangle, or just the assistance that, the, that, that this work was made for direct action. And that was the model. But what I admired about it so much is that ACT UP, and mostly by the artist's assistant, gave artists the space to do what they do. They gave the artists the space to just design, obviously to listen to the meetings, but they weren't working the phone banks, they weren't doing all this, they weren't knocking on doors, they were designing. That's the beauty of an art affinity group. And they didn't just have artists, they had nurse affinity groups, they had all these different affinity groups. And ACT UP, another thing I, I so appreciate about is in the New York Public Library, all their images are there for free for anyone to use. Uh, that's part of their principles and part of their ethics. And ACT UP and Grand Fury teaches movements today. And I'll, I'll explain in a second how that very model of an art affinity group influenced the work we do in OSIS. So um, I had the great honor to collaborate with you folks, with Marquette and the Center for Peacemaking, for the students to do an art. And if the term art field isn't familiar to you, that makes sense because it's, it's, it's not what you know, but it should be. Uh, what I love about art field is it says everyone is invited. We're making stuff together. We're creating community. And the way we see art field is you're working with a movement, making a message, in this case, painting banners. We have art field at the Moses Building on Mitchell this past Sunday for the Essential Rights uh, Network. And the goal was, uh, the main thing of that all day, for all, all day uh, conference, was to teach and train uh, the art making, the art of the tactic. And so, a um, banner was designed, it was traced, and then everyone took part. And that's so important because sometimes we think that you have to have this, you know, God-given talent in art, or you have to be trained in it. Uh, I don't think that's I think we're all creative people, and especially when we're doing work like this. We all have an important uh, role to play in, an important part in creating this, and this builds community. Um, these banners are obviously for the streets and it's for the messages, but we forget that this act of creating and coming together is what strengthens, strengthens the movement. And a lot of the movement organizing is difficult, it has ups and downs, it's mentally taxing. And I've heard more times than not that every time we're doing our adults and groups, and this has been energizing and gave us so much uh, power and community building to the movement that sometimes we forget that that's one of its key roles. And you just work with incredible people uh, who are just sharing with uh, my dear friend, uh, Jeanette Arnold. And so my introduction to MOSIS was really seeing the mating. And ever since uh, 2000, early 2012 or so, May Day has really been about immigrant rights uh, all over the country and the world. And I, every May 1st, whether I'm working or not, I'm there. I, and that comes first. Monday, this coming May 1st, class is canceled. It's May Day. It's marching in the street. And uh, I started to meet folks in the movement. And sometimes, um, I don't think what I do is very unusual at all. And it's students in the room or folks that are inspired by this work. It's simply, all it's about is just getting involved in the movement that inspires you. And then eventually having those conversations, hey, what do you do? Oh, you're an artist? Oh, we could use you. Or, and that's how it began. And so Moses um, did not have a graphic designer position, did not have you know a call to that. What they had was just was an incredible human being. She's like, you're an artist? Why don't you do the next painting? Or 
so 2016, um, I did the May Day poster, and that I was essentially uh, their artist for the year. And I saw Paul's I'll talk about that in a second. But that, that May Day march was essentially for a Latino, a day without Latinos, a strike. Um, the Latino workers work walking off their job, especially the dairy farms uh, across, across the state. And this was uh, during the time of incredibly repressive anti immigrant legislation. Not that it isn't happening right now, uh, but uh, the power of the Moses movement was immediately flooding the capital. And this was, uh, this was the incredible image that inspires me to no end. But if I didn't tell you what this, this march was about, or this action was about, you wouldn't know. And a number of years later, you would know what we flooded the, the, uh, ca the Capitol, because we're also creating the key slogans and banners for the camera. And this action at the Capitol, just like this year, was about uh, driver's licenses for all, and how it's constant. The harshest states uh, for anti immigration legislation, unlike Minnesota, that does have driver's license for all, regardless of your status, uh, your legal or your citizenship status, uh, Wisconsin doesn't. So we tried to learn from this and make sure, especially with those very bold uh, banners that say driver's license for all, and it's always fun walking the Capitol like a week before the action with tape measures, and people are like, What do you do? And I'm like, Nothing, just measuring your building, you know, planning for it. Um, you know, they'll, they have no idea what they have, but um, this is also for the camera. And we can't deny that marches are performative. They are for the camera. And it's to, end, it's to create your own media, but also enter the bloodstream of mass media. And so the banners, posters, uh, signs, they help achieve that. Um, when I talked about the influence of Grand Fury, when Trump was uh, horrifically elected president, uh, one of the greatest crimes of the human history, we knew that his rhetoric, and especially his anti-immigrant anti rhetoric, his, his you know, denying climate change, we knew that those words uh, were real, and that they're, that's, that's something really bad. And in our meetings in Moses, uh, I spoke up and said, just having one artist as a volunteer is working. So we need more. And one person can burn out, uh, they can get sick, they can have a kid, and then they'll let down the movement. And so I proposed what we need is a act up grand theory style party committee group. And Christine and the Moses staff. So we uh, almost immediately called and started a art community group called Moses de Los Artistas, BDLA, that formed the day after the presidential uh, elect election results were known. Were known. And we went from one artist to 40 artists in about two weeks. And that really became incredible because all of a sudden we had many graphic designers. We had printmakers. We had photographers. We had videographers. We had sculptors. All of a sudden, all working in a affinity group, but taking directions from the comms director, Sam Singleton Freeman, at the time. And one of the first actions we did, which was such a beautiful name for uh, a march, it was right at the time of the inauguration of Trump. It was the inauguration of our revolution. And about 30,000 people marched. And you can start to see that the, the streets were flooded with screen printing signs that we're starting to emerge out of uh, the art affinity group. And Christine uh, was saying, you know, the art is starting to catch up with the power of our organizing and what we do. Um, and you can see it. Uh, we had a staff photographer, Joe Brusky, in the art affinity group. And Joe Brusky, we call him the people's photographer. He works for MTA, the teachers union, and works for, does their social media photography. So he's documenting on the Moses movement and many other movements. But his photographs are the source materials for the artists and the printmakers in the group. You can see this beautiful image that was created. This is what happened with so many artists working in the group. I make the case, and many others on both coasts, and the South, and Canada, and beyond, said they have 
not seen anything like the Artisan of Wood that's coming out of the East. Waukesha did not know what hit them when 30,000 people marched because their sheriff was trying to have the police collaborate with ICE. Moses showed up, but he showed up with thousands of people and signs. And so now, today, you know, we have a part of in the Moses Art our, um, office where we barely have space to, to store all the art. We have so much banners and, and, and signs, we have to pick and choose do we need to know. We have enough people to carry all these. But these messaging becomes really important. And the artist really has to be humble. Uh, the artist can't say, I have the best idea, or this is the best graphic, or, I think it's right, or this is what I learned in school. You have to listen to the movement, the movement leaders, because they know best. There's been a zillion times I've almost finished the design, but the director most of says, you know, I don't think this is going to reach the people the best. Can you make major changes? And the artist has to be willing to do that. And in truth, it's that collaboration that has the most power. Um, if we talk about uh, nonviolent civil disobedience, the art actions are part of that too. Uh, leading up to the 2020 election, we knew Wisconsin was going to be one of the key states decided, and getting out the vote was of critical importance. So we learned from that many other artists like uh, Michelle uh, Ortiz in Philadelphia, Black Lives Matter movement, you name it, that doing non permission street work and doing huge letters in the street were right on. And Moses, Christine said, we should ask the city. You know, we have a good partnership with the city. And I remember having months of meetings with the mayor's office saying that we're using water soluble paint, it'll be all right. And they're like, well, we, we want the message to be this, I'm like, not your decision. And then the mayor's, the mayor's office said, we have to think about this. And we said, we're doing it anyways. We're not going to not do it. Come arrest us, we're doing it. And then they're like, all right, we'll do it. It's all good. And so, you know, this was designed for the camera, too. You can't see this when you're just walking down the street. What you can see is 300 people in solidarity painting. But you can certainly see it when the drum photographs was made and we made a video that went viral all over the state. Because it wasn't just about getting people to vote in Milwaukee. It was about all over the state. And that's the power of art. We also did an all-city remixing campaign. Every boarded up space we saw, we had teams about 30 people we paced in the city. Um, civil disobedience in front of Tammy Baldwin's office. Why? Um, because her voice is not strong enough and urged citizenship for uh, the millions of undocumented people. And this sends a message to her that she's not going to get our vote and our support if she doesn't stand up for immigrant rights. Um, same thing over the summer. Uh, we took, took the movement right to D.C., right to the Mayorkas' home. Uh, six in the morning, who showed up in Wisconsin? You know, painting the streets. So every neighbor in this entire block knows uh, that he is not enforceable enough on immigration laws. Um, and this was one of those actions that gets, gets your heart beating. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if you're going to jail that night or not. Um, by painting and by marching in DC. Uh, but most, as I've long said, most one of the most powerful movements that Wisconsin's ever seen, one of the most powerful, uh, obviously, immigrant rights movement in, in Wisconsin, but arguably nationally as well. Uh, and so this is a movement that it all is all are welcome. It's a uh, you know a movement that is membership run for all people, all races. Fights for everyone. So people say, why are you in this? I said, I'm an ally. But, you know, when we don't stand up for immigrant rights, it harms all of us. It leads to people like Trump being elected. It leads to repressive laws. When you're part of these movements, these solidarity movements, uh, it fights for justice for all of it. So that, um, in, in my work now, I can just tell you how it's evolved. Um, I'm just so humbled and um, just so happy to see how art is involved in most that it began with one person volunteering, essentially, then it moved to another artist, it moved
moved to 2016 to an Artfinity Group, and now there is a full-time graphic designer position that's a well-paid, with benefits, with pension position that uh, Harold, uh, how Harold uh, Resin just took, and it has a photographer, it has web designers, and I am a very part part-time art organizer on the Collins team. And to me, that's what all social justice movements should have, that they should have these, these spaces for artists and designers and photographers in social justice movements. So the dream that I've seen in most is uh, we're trying to export it to many other movements, and there's probably a lot of movements that do have that, but I'm not aware of. Um, I know in prepping and preparing this talk, um, I was asked also to talk about climate stuff. So I want to share a little bit about that work, because it's all connected, right? It's the no, intersection. And to me, fighting for climate justice is fighting for racial justice. They can't be separated. It's very much like that movement in 1999 against the WTO. It was against corporate power. It was against the 0.01% that are messing up the world. And that's what the climate movement is all about. So um, at the forefront of this, of this uh, climate justice movement is NATO soft organizing at the front line. And you see Native and First Nation movements across Canada and the United States as leading this movement and leading the direct action, leading the blockades of the pipelines that is fighting for a climate, the climate all over the planet. And so obviously, I think with this crowd, this crowd the most about standing rock and the historic gathering of what, over 700 nations uh, for over a year uh, in standing rock. Um, through Just Thieves, I designed an image on my laptop, sitting on my couch, in the lobby. So that's the power of these rules. Uh, when I say that we should break down the hierarchies of art, we can all now design on our laptops. Everyone in this room is a photographer and a medium, right? With the, the, the camera you have on your phone. So that breaks down the specialty. So we, I put this image up and many other artists, not just just these artists, we put up artists from all over the world as these free downloadable graphics. And then I noticed uh, just by keeping up with what was happening in Standing Rock, I saw this photo of the art tent on, on the O'Shea second one camp that at that point had 5,000 people. And I noticed my image had been burnt to a screen and was being used as a, a patch. Uh, for the water defenders, people doing nonviolent, uh, peaceful prayer demonstration against the Kodaks in Taiwan. Um, but I had to do that, and I had to go as an ally and bring supplies. So I reached out to my department at UWM, probably gathered about $5,000 worth of print, printing materials, fabric, you name it. And myself and Paul Keelan helped with the art build, got into the truck, and drove outstanding rock. Basically said, how can we help? We're here for five days as an ally, and just they go to work, screen print, print nonstop. And thanks for bringing all these supplies. Have more people in Milwaukee bring more supplies. And it was fascinating too when I was there. The bottom motto be keeper of the fire, right? Bringing nonstop wood for burning fires. So it was just it was one of the most unbelievable learning experiences of my life uh, to be there. But it talks about um, perhaps the role of the ally, my privilege, but also how graphics can be disseminated and shared. And obviously, my graphic had to be approved by the by tribal elders, and the majority of the graphics were done by Native people uh, who were there, and I was very much working as an ally. When I mentioned David Solman earlier, someone who inspired me. David Solnit also went on Standing Rock and used his time and skills as a carpenter to build the art tent. He was actually the artist for many years, the artist of residence or the art organizer of the 350.org. And David Solnit was about kind of five to ten years older than, than me, and he's a machine. He does this type of direct action every seem, seemingly every single day, nonstop. Um, and what he does, besides doing banners and art builds, training all over the country, he's the one that inspired and taught a lot of our techniques here in Milwaukee. 
but they're always shutting down, uh, shutting down the city, shutting down corporate polluters with these nonviolent art actions. And this is painting uh, on the street outside a massive um, uh, bank, essentially. And this, to me, is sophisticated art organizing. This is the map of all the intersectionality of the movements, all creating this. This is not by permission at all. And you know who is protecting the, paint, the, the painters while they're doing this the whole time? A group in San Francisco called the Raging Grannies. The Raging Grannies were the, the front line protecting the artists while they were doing it. So this was an unbelievable action. And this is bringing the message right to the heart of uh, these massive corporate powers. And David Solnit's doing this almost every week. Last week was against Wells Fargo, one of the biggest funders of climate case chaos, and he's doing it primarily in the Bay Area, but also all over the country. So I show you this work because we don't see this work really in the art history books. We don't see it in museums. And uh, the whole art world, if I say David Solman, they're like, who? We've never heard of him. And he's my art hero. His sister's Rebecca Solman. You've probably heard of her, one of the great writers of our time. He's a brilliant, brilliant um, but these are the type of artists that inspire me, the type of artists I teach to my students in my classes. Uh, I, I don't necessarily talk about the art stars, those commissioned by the art world. I talk about groups like the Liberate King, young people in London who said, you know, we want the museum to actually talk about our values and what's happening in the world. And what they did is they brought a wind turbine to the museum, I don't know, as a gift. And the museum did everything they could to block so the museum is not using the platform and its influence the way it should, talking about the crisis of its time. And Liberate Tate wasn't just saying that the museum should do more, they should say you should also not be funded by British Petroleum. And they did a long campaign to kick British Petroleum out of the tape, and they won. And to this day, we don't know who Liberate Tate is, their individual names, but they are heroes, and they're incredible people and that are making massive and it talks volumes about um, the role of the art, the role of that we can't all do things by ourselves. We're po more powerful in groups and collectives and working in solidarity movements. Um, I went with David Solomon to Paris uh, for the COP21 COP conference. It was the famous one that Obama was at. I didn't go there because I was invited. We were there to be on the streets and to urge world leaders or to tell world leaders they're not doing it. You know, we don't trust you. And that's people's movement that shaped history, not a benevolent leader of the oil and gas state that's going to be right by us. And so the plan was to do a massive direct action. Seattle asylum shut down, Paris shut down the conference, very much like, like, like Seattle, but then that horrible terrorist act happened in Seattle, I mean, in Paris three weeks earlier. And there was basically a law by the French government saying you cannot have groups of more than 10 people on the street. Well, of course, we didn't follow that. Of course, tens of thousands of people were on the street. But the massive direct action didn't happen. Uh, but what did happen was artists from all over the world showed up. And you had the Icelandic artist, Oliver Eliasson, bring icebergs from Greenland. Now, we can critique the fossil fuels that are used in that transportation. And that's okay, but this was one of the most poetic metaphors I've ever seen. And this brought me to tears when I visited a couple of times, and many others, when during the duration of that, that, of that conference, when world leaders by and large are failing the world, these icebergs went. It was the power of art, it was the power of metaphor. Um, he is a famous art and world person, and he's doing incredible work. And so I'm not arguing that everyone should go into the world of work and move. There's space and lanes for all different uh, venues in art. Uh, but in, to me, it matters what you're saying. When we're talking about art builds, uh, we're doing art builds all the time in Milwaukee. Uh, we have a group called the Art Build Workers uh, that has many of my colleagues at UWM and outside of it doing art builds, mostly with the teachers union, a lot of crossover with Moses, but also with young people. Short high school students led the global climate strike, inspired by Greta Thunberg. And 
And you know, I felt like a novice organizer compared to these high schools. They were such badasses, so powerful and so amazing that uh, it was just uh, incredible to just watch the organizing. And one of the patches, a screen printed patch, uh, to go on, on the back packers lecture, it was my design. Uh, but there's so many images. And again, the art builds are where the community happens, it's where the joy happens, and where it's a lot of the movement culture happens. Uh, this was one of the amazing children high school organizers. And the best banner of that whole action was a portrait of her that said climate action now. And you know, that was just a one day, one day march. But it was in solidarity with marches that happened all over the world because you had Greta Thunberg uh, when that point was middle school or high school student inspiring action and real climate justice organizing uh, all over the world. And that's the power of movement, uh, but also the power of culture. So I want to close up with just a few things. Uh, I've got since we're at a museum that this. This work I'm showing you does not exist outside the museum, too. The museum has an important role. Um, this stuff can be archived, it can be shown, because it's incredible teaching tools as well. Um, and there's incredible work being created through multiple movements in this community and beyond. And this is vital movement culture. So, Josh McPhee of the Star of Justice, he also started the Interference Archive in Brooklyn which is a massive people's archive of social justice, movement culture from all over the world. One of his major shows is called Science of Change, Social Movement Culture, 1960s to now. That was an exit art, that's an incredible catalog. But he literally had movements from every corner of the world documented on the wall of this, of this show, including t-shirts, because these t-shirts too are part of the social justice movement. Um, when I went out to the Bay Area in 2016, I was so thrilled to see David Solnit's work in the museum. And he was like, I could care less. That's not why I do this. I could care less. I'm like, but your work's beautiful. And it's amazing that the museum, the Bureau of Vice Center of Arts, is creating an exhibition, talking about what's happening in the community and in the streets with these unbelievably powerful movements. And, uh, Melody Cervantes and Jesus Barraza, who also are just seen, there was a massive wall of their prints. And I would argue they're some of the most incredible printmakers working the last 30 years. But to see their work uh, in the museum, but also in the streets and in movements given away, but also in the show, <coughs> I thought was really important. Because these museums uh, have very important roles. They can safeguard the work, they can preserve it, they can teach it, and it can still be a so I think that's the last image I have for you. Uh, thank you so much. I didn't look at my phone, so I have no clue that it was 45 minutes. Yeah, it's improving. Um, so I think we had time to use some Q&A now. So um, anyone has a question,
faster you get, the better. But I'm less concerned if the work is perfect in like a wedding or a museum or so forth. I'm much more concerned, does it meet the goals of the movement? Did we go through the steps where everyone's voices in the movement was heard, when it went to the right um, structure within the movement? Like for instance, in Moses when we're doing organizing, I don't make work on my own and just throw it out in Moses. It has to go through the comms director and that team, and then it ultimately has to be approved by the director of Moses. And so that's the step. And sometimes our deadline is 12 hours. Sometimes it's like three days. And so if it's only 12 hours, it may not be the best work, and it's a different different way that I approach if this museum says, in six weeks, you can do a piece on the wall. Because I'll have a lot of time planning. So it's really rapid response. But what I like about the work, and just like the patch that happens in the center of peacemaking, the justice patch, you know, that came together, what, an hour? We didn't even have time to think if it was great or not. And it was. It was, it was amazing because it came out of that collective process. And it really gained its power when it got printed and then worn and shared. That's when it became something special. And all the raggedness of it, the imperfection, is what made it so unique. So I hope that answers your question. But to me, a lot of it is the work that happened before in all the conversations. And the art, the actual art objects is just part of it. And when it is finally collected, if it is collected, I think it's important. Uh, I didn't mention this, but um, one of my roles in Moses is an archivist, and that I convinced first the organization and then UWM to house Moses as permanent archives so that it's shared with everyone and digitized. And Moses said, We don't have time to do this. We, we're, we're constantly doing struggles every single day. We don't have time to do this. I'm like, I'm like but my colleagues at UWM do it, and we've been collaborating with them we on the archiving. And so now all this movement culture that we've created in most in the last um, decade, it's all now at the UW Library. And that will be preserved and shared forever with people. And the other thing I didn't say is um, when we do printed copies of most of stuff, we always keep 20 extra copies. And we create box sets every couple of years. And we work with an organization called Bookman, Artist Alliance. In uh, New York, and then they package our stuff and sell our movement culture from Moses to library collections all over the world, like the UC Library, UC Berkeley Library, or NYU Library, or you name it. Uh, and that money that we, that we get funds a lot of our art, art organizing. So we create a structure in Moses where we're now self reliant in all our art production, our, all our material. Don't come out of the most budget. Uh, so, you know, that archive is really important. We put a lot of good work into it. But when museums get it, they love it because they're like, this is the real stuff. It's not framed, it's got, you know, wrinkles, it's got the safety pins in it. So it's just a very different way of working. And different parameters. Uh, the goals are different. Okay, and, uh, Um, well, what I, you know, I, I try to give, I just was inspired by the student. I mean, colleagues like me and Chris, folks like that, people similar my age, I was, just was inspired by the energy and the leadership of students. I remember during the workshop, you know, some folks came and they were there for 15 minutes, and they might have been faster on the computer in designing than me who teaches design. And so it was just another humble reminder of just the power of many, and also um, listening to young people and really honoring young people in those roles. So yeah, I was just inspired. I just came back really just uh, thrilled. 
It was a teaching of the learning moment. I had a child who was involved in organizing around a political event that's happening in the summer of 24. They won't tell me what it's about, <laughs> what their organization is about. Um, did the local art community have anything planned to even discuss? <laughs> <laughs>
Damon, um, he was a great work of nicer, um, and had a tremendous digging for it, and how she would use music and art to get people to make commitments and action mm-hmm. and to try to get them follow through. So, so I don't know, it's just sort of tying together a lot of things that I've been thinking about lately in certain periods, you yeah. know, certain points in the future. Well, I mean, some people also call me surprised when I'm singing. Because the songs were so powerful and they were so part of that struggle. Uh, what you know, you think of Nina Simone and uh, and the power of her lyrics and, and her song. And so, you know, again, like all movements need this culture and they they seem to need because that's how that reaches our heart and soul and that's the messaging. So I focus on visual arts. So obviously I know about the music that comes out of this little the civil rights movement. movement. But, you know, arguably it was the songs that took center stage. When you talk about folk school, that's just the incredible space of the intersectionality movement. Of not just racial justice, but labor. And these are incredible spaces. And with, I've been involved with VOSIS for a decade now, but VOSIS started as a worker center. That's how it started. It started really uh, as a worker's rights center. And that evolved into what it is today. So it's never forgotten those roots. And when I, when you said the civil rights movement, that's what I said to the most of staff. I said, imagine if we never saw the movement papers of SNCC. Imagine if we didn't see the posters. Imagine if we didn't see these transcripts. And I went to staff and said, well, we're, we're not SNCC. I'm like, yes, you are. Like this, this is the room, the mass, the vital mass movement of, the time, of our time, and this stuff is so valuable and such a teaching tool for decades to come that that's why this stuff has to be preserved. And I have a colleague at UW, uh, UWM who's South African, and said, and when they saw our, all all that we've saved, meticulously archived, they were like, "This breaks my heart," and I'm like, "Why?" It's like, oh, the anti-apartheid movement out of that. You threw away almost all of it. It just got finished. And so the role of the archive is, to me, a huge part of the world. It's a huge part of the activism. It's making it, it's getting it out there, and then preserving it. So that sounds like an incredible trip. Absolutely. I would like to go to the, the lynching Brian Stevenson started. And when we talk about breaking down the hierarchies of art, it's a lawyer who made the most powerful memorial arguably in the last 50 years, Brian Stevenson. Most powerful memorial artist working today, right? Brian Stevenson. Well, thank you again so much. <laughs> Thank you.